call up the readers, just to give you a short little information on who Lennox Robinson was. He was actually born here in Douglas in 1886, and he died in 1958. He was educated in the Bandon Grammar School. Although he had very little education because of ill health, he became a great avid reader, very fond of reading. Sing, sing a play called The Rising of the Moon in the Cork Opera House in 1907, he became very interested in the Irish uh, nationalism, he being a Church of Ireland. On the death of Singh in 1909, he became the manager and director of the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. His best known plays, The Big House, The Far of Hills in 1928, Drama at, the, uh, at an Inish in 1933. He has many other plays as well, but these are the most famous plays he had. He also travelled the world from China to the USA. Now that's just a short synopsis of, of Leonard Robinson. But I know this is fairly new to us here in Douglas GA, so we welcome it with open arms and open heart. Billy McCarthy, we all know Billy from Douglas GA, so you can give Billy a round of applause there, folks. <laughs> Billy is better known for his books like The Barnestown, to Ballinglana. He's also involved in the archive on the north side of the city. He's also a member of Douglas Writers Group. <laughs> Thanks, Michael, and I think I'll ask you to introduce me in future. <laughs> so it sounds very good, doesn't it? Now, I always want to be some sort of a poet or something like that. Someday maybe I'll get there. But this is an idea of how I started off, and if I'm going to offend one of your favorite poets, Please forgive me, it is all in fun. I have harbored one ambition since the day I saw the light. And I had no inhibitions, as I felt I had the right, to pen poetic verses and short stories too I might, if I only had the talent to describe. So I studied Robert Service as I really liked his style. And I followed his adventures through the Yukon for a while. But I tired of all my wanderings, mile after endless mile, being the object of many a mocking jibe. Now Milton was an English poet of typical old school, and Thomas came from out of Wales with verses coarse and cool. Young Burns was a Scotsman, quite loyal as a rule, singing songs of Afton water and green braes. But the, but the rhythms of Australia I liken to our own, and the rhymes about the outback that I never have outgrown. And with John O'Brien's bory log, I never felt alone when the summer had gone, gone, gone down on winter days. So I thought about the poets and the novelists of Ireland, composing songs and sagas of this godforsaken Ireland and calling us to sing the praise of our beloved Sireland round the glowing open fire of turf and logs. But Yeats, I thought, was something of an unforgiving cad. O'Connor, too, in his own way, was every bit as bad. And Bean, though an extrovert, extrovert sorry, so often sick and sad, writing verses of the banshee and the bogs. But I'd like to write a story or a poem with fancy frills, like the novels in the library with such romantic thrills, or like Wordsworth who got his highs in fields of daffodils while strolling in the early morning dew. So sitting at my desk, I'll write whatever comes to mind, and as I do, I just relax and let my thoughts unwind, and maybe then the very lines I'm searching for I'll find. And I dedicate my masterpiece to you. Thank you. <laughs> now, actually, what I want to do here is uh, talk about a lady who I knew uh, all my life. She always declared, sure, I knew William Mack before he was born. And that was true. If uh, ever a statement was made. I called it our treasure. This lady actually, she had a, she had a stall in the coal kit later on in the market. And she used to sell, I think they used to call it fresh meat. 
It was backbones and crew beans and pig's tails and pig's heads and all that sort of thing. A lovely woman, if ever there was one. Bear Band was a treasure. A lady any community, community would be proud to call its own. The subject of rem my reminiscence was a respected residence of Quaker Road in the South Parish where I was born and reared. Of course, we youngsters never called her by her Christian name. Oh no, that was the privilege of her old acquaintances and those loyal customers who frequented her meat stall on the Colquay and in later years in Cox English Market. They referred to her as Babe and Cain. The Cain part was, of course, Cox slang for her maiden name, which was Keen. But to me, my siblings, and indeed to our parents, she was always Mrs. Scannell. She was married twice. Beban had one surviving child, Nora, who developed a serious eye complaint at an early age. An operation was advised which they knew would either cure the disease or leave the young girl without sight. It was decided to go ahead with the procedure and tragically the latter was the result. Nora lost her sight at age 16. To commit Nora to an institution for the blind was never an option. She remained in the care of her mother throughout the man's lifetime. Mother and daughter resided in a little single-storey terrace house just across the road from where we lived before moving around the corner to Evergreen Road in later life. The neighbours were quite concerned for Nora. How could a sightless middle-aged woman cope in a strange house? But they needn't have worried. Nora, still under the care of Bear Ban, quickly learned the geography of the new surroundings and with a little help from some good friends, continued her attendance at daily mass and her regular trips to town. Bear Ban passed away on the 19th of February 1980 and my good wife had the privilege of nursing her through her final illness. Nora lived on for a further 16 years, finally closing her eyes on this world on the 22nd of August 1996. May the sacred soil of Douglas rest on you, rest easy on you, Bear Ban and Nora, and may the good Lord keep you forever in his care. Thank you very much. When walking through West Douglas Street one sunny summer's day, I heard excited voices like the sound of kids at play. So I made my way without delay towards the hurling field, and there the source of happy sounds unto me was revealed. Some thirty boys near twelve years old were out there on the side, and a man of middle age I saw, with the stature of a god. Then as I watched, I clearly saw this mentor's thoughts unfurl, and as one hand grasped a slither, and the other held a hurl. He called instructions clearly, though I never heard him shout. His every order was obeyed, no player had any doubt. For this he then knew, that many years had taught this man the score, and he would teach them all he knew, and maybe even more. They blocked, they hooked, they clearly looked like lads who knew their stuff. Their clean, free-taking, sideline cuts were class acts, sure enough. The trainer put them through their skills and told them never fear. They'd wear their colours proudly before the end of year. I stayed and watched intently as they practised for an hour. Those gangly youths I stated through displayed uncanny power. Lifting, striking, straight and true, no one could ever doubt. These lads had something special. They knew what they were about. But something special only comes to those who prepare to strive. The plans are laid, they'll make the grade, and someday they'll arrive. They'll lift elusive silverware, each first team player, each sub, and they will bring the glory back to their beloved club. Well now I've reached the autumn of my life, at least, and so, I often think of those young lads I watched so long ago. 
They are winning adult titles now. They, we honour them each year. And we talk about the stalwart one we'll hold forever dear. He lived just round the corner from the club in Galway's Lane. We are happy now to, to know his efforts were not all in vain. And each one learned at his own pace and never had to cram. For he was coached by Liam Collins, known to all as Sam. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the man of the camera there, Lee McCarthy. He's been following these people all around. A big round of applause for Lee McCarthy. Please. Also to the man in sound, Mr. Pete Duffy. You all know Pete Duffy, the musician here. And just to let you know that Pete is also a book writer, an author. He's a book on sale at the moment. It's called The Old Dog for the Hard Road. So that's on sale there for a tenor, folks. So again. With us tonight, too, is a young man who got a very famous award there for a couple of months ago. He won the Irish Book Awards for the short story. Ladies and gentlemen, Billy O'Callaghan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Billy's book, as I says, The Things We Lose and The Things We Leave Behind. A fantastic read. It's here as well. So come along and support our own. Thank you very much. Also, I want to thank Billy McCarthy for coming along and bringing this show here tonight. It was Billy, Billy's idea, and I think it's an absolutely fantastic idea. And also, Billy, I felt it a great honour for me to be asked to do MC for you. It's always a pleasure to do that. Thank you very much, Billy.